drifted alarmingly in the bedding was, you know, offensive in the morning, it continued to drift, it was laid on the, on the exchanges to, to lose, it was something you'd see in a, in a Dick Francis novel, Charles Bottoms. The ground is soft, it's not, it's oh, not, it's heavy. Soft on time, so it's, it's, it's heavy. Okay. Hello, and a big one welcome. Yes, it's the last year's Sunday sermon time, and it's a crackerjack of a show this week. Plenty to discuss racing wise, and also plenty of funnies to get through John's fantastic Twitter ask for questions. And a lot of you have responded, so thank you very much. So, chaps, John, Chris, how's the week been? Awful, <laughs> unremitting gloom and despair. Just, we... just fucking dreadful. Yeah, we can start to show off with all miseries, can't we? Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. awful. Yeah, and look at that, John, on Saturday. You had uh, carry the one as an account bet for the pod the time before, and then look what it's gone and done. It's typical, isn't it? You know, the, the rhino bites me on the bollocks once again. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm just trying to picture that now. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that is painful. Yeah, it'd be good if you can actually straddle a rhino's head in order to facilitate the bollock baiting, but yeah, no, I mean, we're all a bit masochist in the in the long run, aren't we? We'll give it a go. Come on, then, we'll get the boring bit done first. This is what all the podcasts do and talk about horses. <laughs> we had a busy week. It was, of course, Dante week and plenty of action there. Certainly, I've produced pointers to future events. So... Let's go through your John first before we take in the sort of lockinge yeah. uh, from yesterday. On the Wednesday, it was, of course, the Musidora Day. Anything that we should be going over in that? I mean, it was probably one of the worst Musidoras I've probably seen. Is that fair? Risk of being an echo chamber. I'd have to agree with that one. I think it was pretty grisly, wasn't it, really? It was also running a very slow time. I mean, you've got a, an 85 filly just easing away from a 92 filly. Yeah, and we can safely say that friendly soul from the slim camp, I know they've won Lockinge, but they had some really, I thought, some shocking outcomes at York this week. How long's the skid mark got, John? Probably the length of time that it takes a full cycle personal wash to get the skid mark out, really. <laughs> this really could see something like at Royal Ascot. What you've got to remember is the Gosden axis of evil will never blame itself for anything. No. Who does that leave, you know? We'll come on to it in a bit, but the, the interview afterwards where he said in spiral was, was needing a run. And mm-hmm. there was not, not a word of that before. I didn't see anything, did you? Apparently he hinted at the fact that this wasn't the main target. Mm-hmm. But there's hinting at the fact that it's not the main target, and then afterwards saying, "Well, she was catching condition, man. What the hell do you expect?" <laughs> as long as you put it eloquently, it comes across as though I know what I'm talking about, and you don't. You well, don't. well, I take you, you. You answer with a certain tone, and there's no area oh, it's like Chapman's even going to question you. Certainly, our band of brothers at York this week. What a table. I've never sat on a table like it. Sweaty we, we, would be the word, wouldn't it? It was like the last yeah. supper. On our table, this is the variance of people that actually, I won't say like us, but would, are willing to sit with us. Are willing to share the champagne with us. Minnells, we'd got a KC on our table. Who was that? You can't reveal names. Why obviously. not? Would he appreciate it, John? He might need his services shortly. We had North Allerton's finest feed man. We had a Scarborough sex pest. We had a Tory councillor. <laughs> we had another professional punter sat with us. We had someone sat with us that's been warned off for eight years and has now come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, good, good. I know, yeah. First yeah. place he comes back to. <laughs> what a table that is. And don't tell me you won't want to be earwigging to what was being said on that table that day. We enjoyed it, John, didn't we? Oh, it was terrific fun. We had a lot of fun. Got great company from a lot of high society, low society, and our very own not totally shit society. So, anyway, I'll move on. So, nothing much happened on the first day, did it? On the Wednesday. 
didn't really see much to ca- get carried away about bad news. It, it, it was like Madam Two Swords in Equine Farm, wasn't it? Ian? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it just highlighted the shitness of Claire Haven on the week, really. So Thursday was a lot more interesting from the horse front. Nice to get one on the ball with Point Linus. The trumpets are out. Blue Stocking was incredibly impressive, John, in the Middleton Philly Stakes. And if Rafe or Ralph listens to this show, I would like to tell them to take the cheek pieces off. What do you think? Well, well, yeah, she, she hasn't done anything wrong. I mean, that, when did they go on? Did they go on after the Irish Oaks or something? Because they thought she was dossy. They went on I mean, after... It turn, uh, turns out they've just been running her over the wrong trip, haven't they? Right? The Chester run, Al Quarry, where she was second, they obviously and felt she should... outstayed. This is it for me. Uh, this is our opinion, me and John's. We, we both agree. Another echo chamber for you there, James Knight, if you're listening. We both think that this Philly's optimum trip is what you saw at York this week, which is an extended mile and two is fine. Mile and two is absolutely spot on. I see her as more of an eclipse Philly than I do what the saying she's coming back for, which is the Lancashire Oaks, the Yorkshire Oaks. I'd be very tempted on that performance. I was very impressed with her foot, a real, real good foot. I have a crack at something like the Eclipse. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't. Maybe if it's a bad judgment, anything like that. I'm not saying she's top class, but her gears will win a lot of races at a mile and two, especially when they falsely run or they, they're not quite going a, an end-to-end gallop. She's got a, a great amount of foot. So are we in agreement with Blue Stocking that the old Rafe Ralph team should be running her over 10 and not 12? Yes, which I'm sure means the next time we say her will be in the hand. We... <laughs> I think he said the Lancashire Oaks, and after that and maybe the, so the, the Yorkshire he, he'll, he'll take her to Ascot. He won't want a thin team at Ascot. No, no he's, had a, he's had a shit t- start to the season anyway. Economics, and we've had a, a question actually on economics. You make of the current Tory government? <laughs> no, it was a, it was about the bleeding of economics from the nostrils after the Dante. PJ Butler's been on and asked that very question. It was quite funny, actually. I think some stable representative was quick, quickly on the scene, John, to say it banged its head on the starting gate. It's a bit like what Coolmore would say, isn't it? You know, we're one of their potential future stallions. Quick end of half a roll of Kleenex used. There was. It was a heavy bleed, yeah. There was a fair bit of claret coming out. Um, if that had started bleeding with the bang on the stalls, you would have had to assume that horse would have probably choked Joe in the race. Mm. It was bad because all the stable team, Maureen Haggis, was on the race track attending to the horse, and before it was allowed no, back in. Of course, they didn't. I, I mean, I, I wasn't really close enough to tell to be hundred percent, but they didn't appear to be any claret on the jockey either. Which, if it had been blowing blood Joe in the race, you'd have thought that there'd been a bit of blow back. That's a fair comment. So it'd be interesting what arms the economics now. We'll see this. If if there appears to be no issues or no problems, I think you'll see economics out probably in the King Ted. I don't think they'll go Derby anyway. That do you, John? I don't think the first to go straight up in trip, to be honest. No. Another one that probably wants to. I think it could be the Hampton Court next next dip. Next time they dip the toe in the water, I think. That'll tell all whether this was a one off, but the, the timing's not, probably not brilliant, but, you know, they maybe wanted six weeks, but I think if they missed that, we can assume it wasn't a bang on the beak. It was half a second quicker than Blue Stocking as well. Yeah, nothing here in those days. That was, that was impressive, very impressive performance. So economic shade, yeah. sky's the limit. Again, another one, me and John say, 10 furlongs, but what will they do? Will they look for the big pots at 12 over the optimum trip of what we think is 10. Big Ev's job, impressed? Bored. <laughs> now, he was in Taylor Bait then, wasn't he? The the big thing putting me off was the fact he'd actually run a skewmer at York before, so I couldn't contemplate taking the price, couldn't back anything to beat him. It was 4.15, so Blucky was just starting to get on my nerves. <laughs> and... I'd, I'd like had enough for that half hour, really. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, oh, London City. That was sort of impressive. I felt in the the finale, 
anything catch your eye for maybe the Melrose in that or not bothered? Well, I, I thought the significant thing about London City, he, he broke a significant losing run for an Athelton Spanish trade match and there were 163 consecutive losing bets. <laughs> which was going so. Considering he was headed and then battled back to allay the trend, I think I think that was massive, really. Agreed. Right, Friday, this is the day we had, we had off. We can't do three days anymore. Festival, can we? We could, we could do it, but there's no point ending up in Marg, is there? I think it's weird. Well, I mean, I drink that much that it's, yeah, <laughs> it's just, it'd be suicide, I think. Uh, but anyway, so moving on to Friday, Botanical was extremely impressive despite ground outs in the handicap there. Have you got a particular race in mind for him, John, if you own Botanical? I think wherever he goes next, he'll probably be fifth. <laughs> He's going to get a thump for that, isn't he? His rating was, of course, 97. Winning that by three would probably see him... He's, Wolf- he's Wolferton bound, isn't he? Yeah, 105, it's eight pound for that. Yeah, he's going to run in the Wolferton and he'll be fit. Skybet, <laughs> the Michael Seeley, diverted queen, quite impressive for golfing, John. With, with that spoke money from Monkey from Clare and finishing second, I'm not entirely sure what she beat, though. But you can't grab the horse for beating what is available, can you? No, Jack's betting that true Cyan ran poor, but held up round there. That mile is never going to suit. He did look very ribby, though, didn't he? Yeah, again, a bit overtrained. We'll get on to King of Steel in a bit and, and Kia, yeah. all that stuff to come. Giovalotta won the Yorkshire Cup, much to our dismay, really. I know you don't like the shorter end a lot of time, John, but Tower of London was weak in the market, and I thought disgraceful, didn't you? Oh, it, was, it absolutely stank the place out. Really, that performance beyond the I mean, Chris, I, I want to bring bring you back in here because this is the kind of thing you don't mind yep. the shorty to plug a cork in the hole, so to speak. But it just seems this week no. there's been a lot of obvious bets, like Tower of London. He, very easy to back on the machine. You could probably get like three or five, three one near the off, seven or four five. We all thought it should be a lot shorter, what it was racing against. We received a negative for Vauban saying that it needed the run a little bit, and that was second. The winner that's pissed up was strong in the market, was thrashed by Tower of London in Maidan. What's going on? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in that message regarding Tower of London, there was sort of a a slight niggle as to whether those horses that have performed well overseas, you know, replicate it first run back and I, and I think it was quite obvious it, you know he seemed to be lobbing along nicely on the outside he pressed the button nothing happened so so he eased it so you know it it, it, it was so bad that you just get you scratching your head didn't it you know even if it's underperformed you expected it to run a lot better than that even if it didn't win and you know the, the week has been well the last few weeks have been characterized by those horses that are running not just below form but are just absolutely tailed off and, you know, I know it's a, sh- a short sample, but fucking hell. I mean, it, it, it tests the it tames lines, doesn't it? But it's like them gods that have got that pull. Jason and the Argonauts and all the yes. gods are looking down through the, that pool and laughing at the cunts and saying, yeah. oh, well, let's put a big monster in the sea to rock the fucking boat. That's what it feels like punting. Look at these idiots. Let's send them all into a fucking... Let's make this run completely shit. Men, men make plans and the gods laugh. That That has sort of a, you know, a, a misquote. But, but it's right, though, isn't it? You know, you think you've done all the homework, yet yeah, this should nearly win. But they're tailed off. You know, consistently mm. tailed off. And, you know, we all say, well, you know, the worst kind of beat is when you just touched off. Actually, when, when they're not even put in the race, you're just flushing money down the toilet. You're not even getting any a buzz from it, are you? You're not even going to get a little rush from, you know, running a good race. They're, they're tailed off and they're, and they're stuffed out of sight. And you're not betting mm. 50 to 1 chances, are you? You're betting at the front of the market where you kind of, your own expectation is this will be there or thereabouts. But they're not. John, what, what did you make of it? It's running a very fast time, this. These gods that you're referring to, <laughs> I don't think they've been active since Doncaster in the 80s and Coratus. <laughs> let's address the elephant in the row. These horses are running like the Ben Gotta. It's the same. That's the last race we're covering, uh, is the Yorkshire Cup, so we've nothing else to talk about in terms of the race. So coming on to Saturday, you got the shirt. And he got three strongly fancied runners on the card, which were Desert Hero. All right, people had said pre parade. Yeah, he got himself in a bit of a stew, bloody blah. It could be a valid reason. But it'd be a valid reason to have the other two not run like 
the legs were tied together, which were God Swinson. Winchester. Yeah, whatever, in the sprint. Three strong fives, three absolutely tailed. It does raise questions. I mean, there was that time when they found the... And I'm not insinuating this, by the way, before anyone cottons on, so they're going about drugs again. No, it, it's just that it does happen. It, like, in years gone by, Mick Easterby had one at Newcastle found, that was found to be dirt. Finished, like, wait, it was about a furlong behind. It was like 11 to 10 fab out, or about 9 to 4, and ran like it. It was a the proper BHA inquiry about it. And it was found that there were dodgy people with stringers, you know, that were going in and doing this. And yeah. Dermot Brown, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was Dermot Brown back in the day, but this weren't Dermot oh. Brown. This, this no, 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 no. But yeah, Dermot Brown were doing it. And who's to say that this isn't creeping back in to some kind of degree? Because some of the runs of these... There's it's, still it's many. Not, yeah, it's not often you get like top group animals running so badly. But there we are. Where there's money, there's a way. So that sort of covers York off to a degree. It was up an up and down kind of week. So that's how it's sort of gone for a while now. Coming on to Saturday, the Lockinge. That was another result for punters, really, that no one could... Uh, fathom really if you want an example of what we've said previously about the the lamentable standard of jockeys in the uk compared to you know the era that 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 when we started in the game look at the lockings you have rab havlin has outridden everybody the ghost of richard hills is back it's extraordinary how you know uh, uh, sort of our so-called top class jockeys have been caught out so obviously you could see a mile off what was going to happen and nobody cottoned on. And, you know, I cannot conceive, you know, the likes of Edry, Pigger, even Carson, you know, any of those guys would not have cottoned on earlier to what was happening. But because all these are kind of jockeys by, you know, painting by numbers, identikit jockeys, you know, all being churned out by the same factory, they all behave the same. And and that was just one of the worst races I've seen in a long time, really. So what we're making about this caper then, John, in Spiral, she's got beat 12 wickets. By the stableman. I mean, he can't have had a fit, can he? He can't have had a fit. Well, it was a miracle she made it to the post after puffing and puffing and lugging her extra 143 kilos around the paddock, wasn't it? Mm. None of which was mentioned in the trainer comments in the racing post. Very race. No. Uh, but, of course, we should have all been wise after the event to su- what a good horse audience was and how threatening he was going to be, stepping up to a mile. Yeah, right Oh. I mean, it, it it was just a sour experience for everybody and chiefly Park and Claire Haven trying to dress it up as everything else is just bollocks, really, isn't it? Don't you think it's a bit a bit weird, though, how they were strung out like an Ida? Yeah. <laughs> so, Six and a half back to Witch Hunter. I mean, I seem to remember the, the Lockings last year they were struggling for a racing line, the same as though they were all over the track. We probably got... What a lot of people thought was a more satisfactory outcome last time. I think the Godolphin horse actually nailed chinned it. But let's be fair, we, we weren't far off the lamentable chinned it landing a, a lush prize there, were we? Um, I don't know. I, the Lockings could be heading for Group 3 status, <laughs> shall we say, the last few runnings. Uh, right. If the Lockings doesn't send alarm bells through British racing and, and what's really happening to the sport, in terms of quality, then if that's not the alarm bell to say, look, we're fucked, then mm. Charing's, got, Charing's gone off four to one mm. to win that race. It's beat Perker face length and a quarter in the bet 365 mile. It's then, prior to that, it won, a, it won the listed Doncaster mile stakes from one of Pam Slyes. I'm sorry, but this is, as in terms of group ones, Again, we said how bad the Musidora was. We're saying how bad this was. Just, I, I, I can't make head in the tail of it. In Spiral, as we know, we even said on the pod, she doesn't come to herself really until later in the summer. That's the general mm. consensus. So I just think it's a terrible heat that's just... I think the winners run to 115. It's funny, the racing person have, have got it to 123. I'm just laughing my tips off at that because how was that ran £9 above its official rating, according to racing person? It hasn't. Yeah. No, of course not. It's ran to under, it, it's eight, everything's just a bag of spanners the rest. I'd just chuck it in the bin. The form's worth it. So we'll move on. We'll go on about King's Gambit because we've got a question from one of our listeners. Owen Johnson said, appreciate it's only a handicap he won, but would you be tempted to throw King's Gambit into the derby? The race he won has a long history of producing group horses and given the derby field at the moment, 
surely it's worth a roll of the dice. What do you, John, do, John, as the owner of King's Gambit? Once he won that off, yeah. 93. 93, he's going to go, what, 8? Maybe 10. Maybe 10. 9, 9 or 10. So I'd be tempted to win another handicap myself. The London Gold Cup was running two seconds faster than the Phillies listed race that finished the car. Yeah. I mean, this could be very smart. Personally, if you were mine, I wouldn't run. I'm not yeah. that bothered. I know there's only one derby, but... Fun, I mean, funnily enough, have... I've, I've just put my ratings away. I've, I've been given 103, sorry. I don't think I'd be going to Epsom in a fortnight of one that's just put a real fast time in it, you know, very off, off a break. That would be a worry, the bounce factor. Well, we've been sort of saying on podcasts, friendly soul bouncing after a big time, caviar heights after a big time at Newmarket. Yeah, I think if this one's going the right way, I think it would pay dividends to hang fire a bit. You know, when you got the Irish Derby a month after that, if you if you want to start getting throaty, you know, but there's no rush, is there? Personally, I mean, if it, I mean, if it were me, if he goes up, say, 9 or 10, 100, uh, 100 and 203, don't you go the, the Royal Asc- Ascot Handicap? Because if you're not going to win that... Well, that's that's, that's what I would have thought. I would, I would have thought you'd go to the King George Handicap and then take it from there. Because like you say, there's plenty of time with it. There's lots of pots you, you available. Know, you've, got, you've got an extra fortnight for the Ascot handicap. Yep. It's not unknown for the winners of that to run in a vault again. Oh. I think Tarchon did something like that. So King's Gambit, you could, if it won at Ascot, the, the King George handicap, yeah. it could then go Gordon or Voltage. Yeah. But I think rushing into a derby, which he's not in as well, so they're going to have to get the, the coin out. Mm. I think it's asking for trouble. Agreed. That come that finishes off the review, folks. This week we'll come to me questions now on on some racing questions before we go a little bit off kilter. <laughs> Bidders has been on. Are the stewards ever going to take safety seriously again, or are we going to wait till a jockey dies to wring our hands? Well, I mean, if you remember, Ty Licky was brought down by the Funky Gibbon. At Kempton and ended up like Ironside. John, is this is this a case of again bad training for jockeys from the bad jockey trainers and coaches? Why we're getting maybe instances of like not giving a fuck? No, you've always had rough riders. Yep, but it's down to the stewards to stamp on it. And the trouble is, I think with the current crop of stewards, they only do what the stapes tell them to do. I don't think you've got much. Uh, independent critical thinking going on in there. Yep. And as a result of that, if a state doesn't flag something up and say, ooh, that could have been a bit naughty, nobody's nobody's doing anything, nobody's bothered. Well it's it's akin to um, affordability. it's akin to affordability, isn't it? Where you have politicians uh, you know, who lack technical knowledge, relying on advice from self-appointed experts. And, and that's the same with the stewards. You know, they don't know what they're looking at, so they're relying on the stipes who are telling them what is and isn't safe. And that's the problem. Yeah, you see, the, the majority of stipes these days, I, I believe, are uh, ex-jockeys. Yeah. So we're probably yeah, not going to other ex-colleagues in the shit if they can help us. I mean, Stephen Thomas referred to an example of at Bath this week. I watched it back in my, my from my own notes as well prior to this show, it, and he said that I forget who it was that nearly put him over the rail as he's trying to make his challenge. But as we all know, John, this is, goes back in the olden days. If the rail's slightly open, you know the jockey in front of you that's canny is going to shut the door on. Of course, that is classed as race riding. Now I get what you're saying, or what Stephen Thomas is saying. I, you know, I'm bidders obviously with your question. Again, at the end of the day, it's like if you watch athletics, I mean, remember Zola Bud and Mary Decker? Yeah. <laughs> Mary you know, Decker Tab. Um, yeah, Mary Decker Tab. And that's it. It's a bit like that. You know, they, they don't budge an inch. And if you try and take the ground, they'll not change the stride pattern for you and let you in. It, it's, you yeah. know, you'll, you'll end up falling over each other. And it's, I think it's the same thing. I, I didn't see the. The problem with the bath, but that was Billy being brave. He went the brave man's route, thought, right, I'm going to take this gap. And then the, the kid in front clearly said, no, you're not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you ain't going up there. So that's how I saw it. So I don't, I, whilst it might look dangerous, I think that's why jockeys are brave sometimes for taking a certain route. I mean, the Lan- Lan- Lancashire Oaks incident, Free Wind and Windy and Jim, 
And that was a similar sort of scenario to Bath, I felt, um, where you're going for that gap and it's like, well, you know what's going to happen. They ain't, they ain't keen. Uh-huh. They ain't keen to give it you. Yeah. That's how I saw it personally. And I know like that some people might say, well, you're a cunt. And well, I am. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, but they might say that completely unrelated to what you were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. It could be anything. Yeah. yeah. Plenty of people think that. Anyway. So- <laughs> you get on a train in London and you have a, like, travel all the way up just to go there. Because <laughs> that, that's what people are like these days. <laughs> it is, sadly. People are people. That were a song. Depeche Mode. Yeah. Yeah. Preferred yeah. personal Jesus myself. <laughs> you got what, your own personal I'll Jesus. Carry one of them round with me, personal Jesus. Yeah, could, could have been my same <laughs> film. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. West. Paul Tompkinson says racing off times are getting ridiculous. What should be done about it? Well, as me and John pointed out the other day, when we were sat in each other's company. We said. What the fuck are they doing with 20 runners, 22-year-olds? <laughs> How the fucking hell do you load 22-year-olds? I mean, the main thing is, whenever it suits them, they split them races, don't they? Oh, yeah. And uh, sometimes they split them to massive disadvantage to the punters because you get, like, a 14 on the field split and you've got two seven runner races. We yeah. don't care about that. They no, should employ Gary Glitter as a stall sign, Louis. They'd have the two year olds running away, wouldn't they? Fucking hell. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um, They'd be getting in that, those stalls quicker than the dose of salt. I would propose this would be me at the BHA, and I'd say to Greg Swift, I said, You've got your whiteboard, get your pens out, and write this down <laughs> for when Julie comes in after a avocado and prawn salad. When she comes in, put that on board, say, Maximum field sizes. 12 runners, two-year-olds. So there's more than that. If it's, if it's a certain level, you split them. There's 18 declared. There's two nine-runner races. Everyone's happy. Everyone's a winner. Try that, and get... That could get Swifty a KBA or something, couldn't it? Well, Greg, if you're listening, there you go. Or YTS kid that's listening to this show yeah. regularly. Next, um, next New Year's on his list. Put that on your whiteboard for when Julie walks in and you'll certainly be well-liked. By the establishment. I don't know that's our, our latest recipe for a cheese roulade. <laughs> Do you know one thing I'd love to see? The BHA dining expense. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, like when they have to keep up receipts for tax money. Yeah. They're like, you'd love to go through, wouldn't you, what they've been eating? Not many of them Morrison's. <laughs> I, I bet it ain't a spud you like. Spud you like gets none of their business. <laughs> I'm telling you. There's no Greg's on there, is no. there? No. Definitely yeah. not. <laughs> anyway. You just, right. just see Julie saying to YTS, kid, can't you? When you finish that message at last, Joe, we'll nip out and get us a good eggs, will you? Yeah, get us a steak <laughs> bite. Yeah. Right, we're coming to the end of the racing questions, thankfully. Yeah, boring, isn't it? <laughs> there is actually a, a couple of... There's, there's two more that I'm going to go through. Because right. I appreciate our listeners yes. that can actually be bothered to type in That's questions. Good. It's good. Dave Bradshaw's cut with a good one. And he yeah. said, given the back history of some notable current owners, as we're coming on to Keir in a moment, who in the panel's opinion will be the current or historical champion Rongan owner? Good question, Dave Bradshaw. It, he was a bit of a handful. His own sceptre, wasn't he? Sevier. I don't, I don't um, remember. Who's he? I don't remember. He was, yeah, he was a queer fucker. I mean... I think she won four classics and she started the season off in the fucking Lincoln. <laughs> Are we talking about owners or, or horses? Yeah, yeah, owners. It was very much owner in the form of an organ grinder, you know? <laughs> um, well, you got Doug John. Wildenstein. Wildenstein was a twat, wasn't he? A couple that I'll just run through, Mill, and one will probably upset people, but I, I, I'm sorry, but JP McManus might mm. be fantastic for the game in terms of providing employment for the industry. Certainly, you know, how can you not knock that? Like the, the fact that he, he supplies jobs to, to lots and lots of people, yep. putting his wealth it, back into the sport. And yep. not for one minute am I knocking that in the slightest. No. But fucking hell. <laughs> when you see one or is that's had six or seven coconuts, sort of like time forms, say, uh, caught the eye last time. Yeah. From the back. So you watch it and you think, fucking hell, they're lining this up. And so you try and second guess them and you think, well, this'll be it then, won't it? And then you just have a couple of quid on. 46 six on machine. 
Them fuckers. How good are they for punters? They stop favourites for shits and giggles all the time. It's just, it's just, it could be an horse that's informed, got a chance, and they'll just stop it. I'm not saying they're taking money out of the machine or doing anything fraudulent, but they'll just go, oh, well, run this wide, held up, and just, why is this acceptable? Well, it's not, is it? Uh, <laughs> but it just seems to me get that accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly for all the reasons you just stated. Yeah, put it this way, right? So, like, it's the world's worst feeling, isn't it? You've got a fancy in the race and you think, oh, I really like this one. Oh, fucking hell, JP's got one in. That is... You can't bet that one until you've seen mm. what he's doing with his. And then money comes for his. And money comes for his and then you then you have to say it out and then his run, might run like shit anyway and yours wins. And it's just an absolute... It's, it's a mind. It's a mind mess. JP, for that reason, for me, in my betting career... He's an absolute pain in the arse. Do you think any, anybody, right, could beat this Wildenstein four-timer, right, in the 80s? Go on. He sacked St. Martin, Piggott, Eddery and Swinburne within about <laughs> two and a half years. I think Keir Jurabchin's trying to sort of like no, get to that level. Right, you, see, um, you may be trying to emulate, but I mean, you're not going to get four more high-profile sackings than that, are you? No. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a whammy, that. The thing is, racing attracts, and Chris knows this, attracts like the wrong ones, arms dealers, drug dealers. It attracts everyone, yeah. you know, like... That but, but racing, to... racing loves money. It just loves mm. money. It doesn't really care where that money comes from. Listen, bottom line is, if the Moors murderers had money, they'd welcome him in. That That's the level of morality that, that, that pervades a lot of the sport. They don't care how you got it, as long as you got it. And, and that they'll take it off you for as long as you got it, and then that's that. And, 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 yeah, that's <laughs> they actually do. That's actually what happens. It's I like... Mean, there was a good doctor, wasn't there, when he had, when he had the arses with Dandy. Poor bloody Dandy didn't know whether he wanted to sit in there. Come on, Tim Kang, yeah. Plans. They'll just have it off you, and they don't care who you are. So, you know, all right, tongue-in-cheek about the Moors murderers, but, you know, there would be people that would train for, for, for Myra Hindley and Ian Brady if they if they were released, if they were still alive and won the lottery. They say, oh, well, you know, what, never what, mind. What, what they call them, they're, they're in, in it, at Bin Laden's. Yeah, yeah, totally. They were killing up to train for them. Yeah, a- a- no, no, a- absolutely. No. So, so, you know, Rachel's no one... got a poor track record of, of, of vetting people, I think. If you, if you Google it and read into it, that, that Kazakhstan owner that's light blue and yellow colours. Yeah, New, New um, Year is, something, yeah, yeah. If you Google him, he's been involved in some... <laughs> it's all a big mess in the big owner world. But, but yeah, I'm on about him punting, punting purpose. So, JP, you win the prize for constantly, like, fucking my betting up, really. Okay, we move on. Great question, Dave Bradshaw. That. So, we come on to Kia. Direction. Now, obviously, Matt Chapman had the... Well, I thought it was very good, actually, because like, some people lesser would would not have asked or tried to go there with all the searching questions. I thought it was quite good. And it was good. Obviously, it was good. Durab- Since he came on the show, though, he's, got, he's grown a pair, hasn't he? Well, we're bumming, it. we're bumming everyone that comes yeah, on the show. It's terrible. We are. We're king So come on, anyone that wants to come on that didn't before. We want Ray from Ralph Brothers in a... In yeah. A, <laughs> coming on to Kia. So he did this interview, and obviously this is regarding, if you've lived under a rock for a week, the withdrawal of the ammo horses from the Roger Vegetables yard this week. They've all been taken away uh, yes. to go to past- pastures new. The bar steward's uh, info line was hot this week before it broke, but I didn't want to break it on Twitter or anything because people call me a shit ape and things like that, so <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Anyway, so Chapman did the interview, tried to find out what was going off. Keir didn't want to talk. He was quite obstructive in terms of... Surly. You know, yes, so, surly. Yes. With, with, uh, regards to King of Steel, who, of course, is injured, and there's been no details revealed of the injury. Well, as a bastard's exclusive, I'll do this bit. The nature of the injury is a tendon, which realistically rolls him out for the season. And if he's coming back at all, it will probably be next year, or, as John says the 2026 Brigadier Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> if sending it to Stout. <laughs> yeah, Buck Rogers will be riding it when it's in the 25th century. Yeah, yeah. But I can reveal it is attendant. You won't be seeing him this year. So there you go. That's another Bastards exclusive, which I'll probably get more abuse for that I always get, right? But then people still give me abuse. So I do know. It's been what it is. Now, the thing is, as far as I can gather on this situation, Kia had withdrawn the the other horses before K 
King of Steel got injured, as far as I can gather. From what I've been told in the order of play, he was not happy with Roger Vegetables before this, I don't know. I'd sort of say, I'd, I'd, I'd blame the Gallops boys sometimes at variance. They, they, they run them like Derby's job on the Gallops. <laughs> you, you, you know what happened? Go on. I'm, I've been thinking about this, and then I think, what this K.A. Jibby Jobby Jabshin needs <laughs> is a trainer with charisma. Mm. Because he needs somebody to, like, have a bit of a rib tickler with him and jolly him along a bit. I think, like, the sort of deadpan persona isn't cutting it. Well, he, he, he needs, like, a bit of his. I'm getting that impression and just, uh, like, well, he ran well, you know, and well, you're hoping to go. So on. I don't think that's cutting it, you know. He needs somebody to put a bit of magic into it, you know, because he's, let's be fair, he's a bit of an arsehole, isn't he? He needs, he needs, he needs jollying along. Sangster, Sangster, you say, right? He had horses with O'Brien, but he also had that buffer. He had his great friend Barrington Hills training horses to jolly him along in the bad times. When he put Michael Dickinson in there, and it was all work, 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 they didn't gel. There was no rapport, if you like. And I think if you get a fucker like that, you, there's got to be some rapport. Yeah, I mean, otherwise I mean... he's gonna go to shit. If you remember, we said it on the show, and I had strong info on this, that he was very upset, apart from other things to do with Kevin Stott, that Stott, when he came in on King of Steel and got and jumped, got off the horse, he didn't go and hug Keir or shake his hand after the race. And that really upset. So he's one of them that's a bit of a, you know, sensitive soul, if you like. Yeah, and, he, he, you know. he, needs, he needs blowing every 10 days or something. <laughs> So what are we saying about him? Is he wrong? And I mean, I mean, uh, Fanshawe said apparently on Nick Look today that he wouldn't have horses trained by him. Yeah, come on, Burns. If he turns up with ten in a van tomorrow, are you saying no? I'm not going to do it. I don't think he's wrong. I just think he's unusual in racing, insofar as he just doesn't lie down and take it what the trainers give him. Yeah, you know, and that's what gets frowned on, you know. Racing as a as a whole entity always sings from the same in shape here, doesn't it? Oh well let's see what the trainer says, you know, it's up to the trainer, you know, so Michael will decide that. You know, it and it's bollocks, isn't it? You know? Why shouldn't an owner have plenty of input and make decisions if he wants? He's paying a fucking fortune. Yeah. We've earned horses, John. And and this is thing, right? We know how some trainers will let you have more say than others. Mm. And yeah. then the, the ones that don't usually end up fucking it all up. And you're aware, <laughs> you're like shit on a shiny shovel getting out of there, aren't you? Let's yeah. be fair. Why punters are quick to defend racing? Of a said you're abjured. I'm not saying he's he's a, he's a straight he's guy. He's not I'm a not... person fresh yet. He's an arsehole. No. He's an arsehole that's paying the fucking bills and he's entitled to make decisions. Mm. Yeah. I think I think it's a combination of factors. I mean, I, I think Varian, as we've said previously, is consistently underperforming, right? And I think personality-wise, he doesn't exude charisma, does he? And so, you know, about people management skills, you know, the most successful business people manage relationships with customers, in this case, owners. So, you know, different owners need a different approach. Some owners are happy for the trainer to make decisions. You know, others want a bit of fun. Others want a bit of interaction. You know, one size does not fit all. And a guy like that who's putting a lot of money in, you'd want to make a fuss of him, wouldn't you? You know, he's I mean, your main he, guy. He is a tip for trainers, really. I mean, if you want every email you send this owner to be treated like a tablet of stone coming down from Mount Sinai, you better be banging in the fucking group one winners. No, that, Otherwise, that is true. forget it. You know? it's like... Like you said, Premier League managers that they have to deliver a certain level it, of expectation. Yeah. And if you fall short of that, then if you're shopping um, trolley in full of group ones, prepare to put the fucking clown shows on and arrive in a collapsing car yeah. to raise a tip bit of a titter because I think we've been fair gonna, there. You're gonna have to know so much. I think we've been fair. We're not saying Keir Jurabchin's an ideal learner because he's not. It must be very difficult training for somebody like that. But at the same time, we know what racing's like. They will string an owner along for as long as they can to earn as much as they can, and that's that's literally how it is. You know, so, <laughs> there are a few trainers in this game 
that will tell you honestly up front and say, especially if there's been, say, an accident in the yard or what I'm dealing yeah. with. I mean, with Kia could probably deal with a, a proper racing manager that can get his arms around it 24 7. Kia, if you're listening, I'm now for sale. Racing has put itself up for sale and he's going to wreck my career as betting every day. Kia, yep, yep, come and pick, pick up the phone. <laughs> I'll work with all you Brazilians. Dan's been on. He says, how much would you pay for Kia Jarabchen to be strapped on top of Goshen over fences in his purple silks? <laughs> I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> I, I get the feeling out there that you're not Kia Jarabchen fans, and neither are we really, but it is what it is. It's, he's lost his star horse to attend an injury, and will we see it on a race course again? Possibly. Don't, who knows? But it won't be racing this season. If anyone wants some even money... Or maybe, lame, even money. Of champions. maybe an even money bet on that if you start saying I'm talking shit, then you know where to DM me and I shall happily oblige you to whatever state you would like. Let's go on to some funnies. Harry Roberts, though, he says, why do traders' sons all look as if they've been buggered senseless at public school job? Because they have been. <laughs> it's a straightforward answer. That's like the black tree ice cream answer, isn't it? What does yeah, black yeah. tree ice cream taste like? Yeah, tree. And I actually asked John that this week, and he said, "Black tree." Yeah, he looked at me, gone out with disdain. Actually, a lot of disdain for John. He said, what, "What's this cut on?" So yeah, Harry Roberts, another daft question. The reason is because they have simple that one. Going through some more questions now. Some funny. Right, hang on. Some no, John. Your thread put this morning. You some really good points here. Yeah, you've said York about food. Yeah, we'll go to York food in a minute. The, the ITV bafter, and no one commented yeah. on this. No one actually commented on this on, on the thread, and I thought it might. Yeah, be, we, well, I did ask them not to mourn. I want, I want, what I wanted, I wanted their highlights that what makes it BAFTA worthy, and yet it gets so many pelters on Twitter because I, I thought that was like worthy of discussion. Because to my mind, the people that's dishing out the BAFTAs are very much like the people that's decided to bring in affordability checks. They don't know the actual nuts and bolts of the game. So they are probably thinking, wow, look at that ITV coverage and the camera work, them really tight close-ups at the three furlong pole. You know, the ones that have us all tearing our hair out. And yet I it's back to worthy. I mean, it might be, I don't know. I, I'll be honest, I, I watch it a little bit, but I don't watch it too yeah. much. Only thing, only thing is, Mick Fitz at Dante meeting, I mm. didn't get that. I didn't understand that one iota. He's a, he's a jumps guy. He wouldn't have a fucking clue about flat racing if it, if it, if it, I don't know. But, but Matt I don't know. didn't say it was just allocated. They get a number of days a year and the, that's the, it. The one Nicky, the one yeah. Nicky Anderson I've got with John, didn't it? So... Well, that really, yeah, that's him done. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I suppose he can put his House of Cavani suit on Twitter and ask all the oiks and the and the poor people to say what what suit he should choose, Chris. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean uh, that that's you know engaging with the lump and proletariat, isn't it? It's a sport for the people, but it's, you know it's a very yeah. uh, clumsy way of doing it. I think. No, he's out of touch. And, and deciding which one of those you'd like in your paddock at home. Mm, yes, of course. <laughs> it reminds me, it reminds me of, of a conversation I had with a lawyer to show how this, this um, disconnected some people are. This person asked me where in Tuscany my second home was. And that, that's absolutely true. The assumption was that everyone mm. has a second home in Tuscany. The only question is whereabouts in Tuscany is your second home? Wow. Mm. Where it, is yours? It's, it's uh, council house. I grass and the child being kicked yeah, out. Fucking evicted, yeah. Fucking nice yeah. And far away, yeah. yeah. So, uh, John also said the boring predictability of trainers' sons. So, John, what was that about? What was that in your thought process? The boring oh, predictability. Sure, sure. Well, a little, a little bit about the previous question, you know, where they all look like they've been buggered senseless at public school. And the fact that they just seem so utterly bloody charmless, you know. I mean, they're all going to take these licences over and it's going to be like there's been a factory chucking them all out, isn't there? You know, the, the, no, every, the bomb knowing every cliche possible to chuck out in an interview. And it's just going to make for a very, very, very bland game, isn't it? Do you think that's what's happened? Like, watch too much Tipping Point, play too much Candy Crush growing up. Absolutely, you know. Yeah, but well, they think know, they're and, better. And, than you. And they... That's it. They think they're better than you. So when they're interviewed, it's almost like you know, how dare you ask me a question? 
you know, and, you, know you can see the, they exude superiority, don't they? There's, yeah. there's massive entitlement in there. Who's yeah. out with every part? Yeah, nepotism in racing is horrendous, yeah. absolutely horrendous. And you know, I'm surprised, John, you didn't talk about teeth in there. Like, who's got the best racing teeth? I mean, well, that's it. that's it. You know, I mean, instead of having races, you could have a competition to say who could get through an apple quickest through a tennis racket. Food controversy at York. Full food review. Well, I'll tell you first hand. The ice creams was absolutely top class. The black treacle, as we've already mentioned on this show, is absolutely top class. Does the exactly what it says on the tin. Quite funny watching everyone walk back with screaming down the wrists and things. You know, I would say the pork pies, John, are dreadful. It was unbelievable, really. Um, rustic looking basket, a uh, friendly woman with the basket strapped to herself. Like meat, meat man in pork, pork pies, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, or cigarette girl in the cinema. Uh, <laughs> first of all, me and Blucky were gonna have a scotch egg. And she said, no, there's no Scotch eggs. So we said, all right, we'll have a pork pie. So the pork pies were £4.90. So you got a bit of change for your father. Mm. It was what I call old woman's pastry. It wasn't hot water crust pastry. It was like the stuff you get at a church coffee morning (laughs) when they've been making corned beef slices. And the minced pork in the pork pie had been through the mincer about eight times, so it was like it resembled pork pate. Mm. And then whatever they'd done to arrive at the jelly situation, I shudder to think. But the minute you bit into the pork pie, the entire jelly contents just pissed all over. Review the hot roast pork sandwich, John. Well, it was supposed to be pulled pork. I think it had all been pulled the night before while watching a porno. Yeah, pulling the pork, yeah. Um, it, it was then spread onto a previously frozen bread bun mm, with gold. probably a teaspoon of gravy added, which immediately demolished the formerly frozen bread bun. Oh. And then they, they added it, a slice of... It appeared to be cheese, but it refused to melt, so it, it raised more questions than answers. And you, <laughs> you, could, you could have had applesauce stuffing... Or a piece of extremely hairy crackling. <laughs> no shaving of your crackling. Oh, Our female awful. listeners, do you shave your crackling? God. <laughs> Christ. Well, do you? Anyway, uh, they didn't shave the crackling at York. So come on, York race course. We've, I mean, we've the, the annoying thing is, they have such great food places at York. Why don't they get some of them in, in them little kiosks and that, you know? Mm. Exactly that, and the producer highlighted something regarding the lack of like they could if they got they, they're heavy on selling champagne in York, but where's the seafood bar, John? You know, like it could be a sea yeah. little, you know, where you get like prawn cocktail mm. and stuff like that. Isn't you know, like isn't there something right down the bottom near where the old paper ring was? Might be. I don't. I don't go down with yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, Only to I buy a Panama think, hat. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think there's something down there you get like seafoody, salady stuff. But like where where we are, where where they're selling champagne by the bucket, it's pretty limited for grub, you know. It, yeah, do well that doing the little prawn cocktails and that there. I'd fa- I'd yeah. have fancy one of them. Yeah, I mean they should give red chili a go, shouldn't they? And give them a chaos. What did you have other not? Tongue tripe and uh, pork blood. <laughs> Set, set it, it, when you told Chris it made him absolutely oh, puke. What's the matter with you? Fucking <laughs> pork blood. It, Jonas likes a bit of roadkill. Final <laughs> couple of questions before we end the show because we're in a short time. Bert's been on Doncaster. We love Bert Doncaster. Mm. Because what's the weirdest thing in your fridge? A woman's well. head. <laughs> now we know that's not true, but I reckon <laughs> you've got some real. Horrible things in your fridge. Oh, I, I, honestly, it's fuck all in my fridge. Just a, a few miserable exactly. peas. Got now, and plenty of it. Yeah, so uh, I'll pass on that. Fuck all. That's... Is it like Bob Cratchit? Oh, Bob Cratchit. Christ, he comes round it. See how I am. That's how bad. <laughs> You're all right. You're getting on okay. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. John, what, what's weird in your fridge? There's a syringe in there at the minute. I don't know what's in it. <laughs> the middle. Nobody's got, nobody's got diabetes, so it could be anything, really. you got Zaruni staying with you? No. <laughs> well, at least you haven't uh, got anything that weird. I said, in, in ours, uh, producer, what's in ours? Monster energy drinks. <laughs>
Yeah, we've still got John's Monster Energy drinks in our fridge, uh, which uh, I don't drink Monster. Anyway, nothing weird, really. Sad we haven't. What's the weirdest thing you've ever heard of people keeping in the fridge? What? Producer says ketchup. You know, I thought she said petrol. Yes, I did. I I thought, okay. Petrol. (laughs) You see, I keep keep ketchup in the fridge. That's another song. Ketchup to the room temperature. Yes, Absolutely, as you is should it, do vegetables in, but always keep it in the fridge, yeah, because I'm... Is that a southern thing? Though? I think it is. I think, it's, I think it's a hygiene thing. We're quite clean down here, you see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, Bert, we, we've got absolutely... We're not, we're not that weird, but yeah. Well, we are a bit, but not, not totally weird, if you know what I mean. I think the is syringe it, is pretty weird, really, especially when you don't know what's in it. What's that doing in there, John? I don't you know. know. It's been there a while. I don't think anybody dare move it. No, you might have to ask your house, mate, what's going off there. Yeah. Come on to the final question. And Jack, our very old Jack replaces Samuel the Cat this week. Samuel the Cat, where are you? Disgrace. An absolute in-house questionnaire for a weekly show and, and you've binned us off this week. You disgrace. So Jack fills in with, what would you have all done with your life's work if racing never existed? <laughs> John? Um, I'd probably have given a fairly boring career if got between the ages of 16 and 18. Turned to crime, not been very successful at it, and probably blown my brains out by the age of 28. <laughs> Do you know, I, I predict similar to that. If it weren't for racing, I probably would have turned to the easy money somehow like and done something. Because obviously, I think that's why professional gamblers do what they do. Because if you've got a brain and you can work out odds and you can work out a race and stuff like that, then you well, if, you, if you can work that out, you can work out as being part of the workforce. You're getting really yeah. shafted as well, can yeah. you? Yeah, I'd probably be bent in, in some capacity in whatever it is I'm doing, whether that's flogging diamonds for an extra few quid or nicking them or whatever. <laughs> that kind of thing, really. I, I'm not the type of person that could ever work for anyone else in an office or like being told what to do or said, no, you, you've got to get this done. You know, it's like, what? Fuck off. Yeah, um, you're always going to end up calling them a cunt, aren't you? Daily. Yeah, it never, never happened. So that'd be me. Chris? Cult, cult leader, I reckon. Cult leader's the way to go, I reckon. <laughs> it is indeed. Well, like Waco or something. Oh, yeah. It would all end in, in, a, in, a, in a firestorm with hundreds of deaths, I think. That, that, right. that, that's, the, that's the end, I think. It is in these days. If you sit on one side of the fence now, like at polar opposites in the media, right, you actually get listened to because... It, it, whether that's like an extreme on one side of the opinion or an extreme on the other side of the opinion, you get listened to. Anyone sat in the middle, no one cares what you think. You've got to listen to the ones that are nutters on that side and the ones that are nutters on that side. So if you're a cult leader, then, yeah, I'm all, I, I think you'd do well. There's dough in it, <laughs> isn't there? There's money. There's yeah, money. yeah, yeah. That, get that, it right. That, that, it is now. I think you're all on the pitch. I, 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 I'd never on talk TV every other night, Chris. Yeah. I'd, I'd target sort of millionaire cheerleaders that don't say anything. They'll be my followers. No fellas. Yep. Yeah. One thing to finish quickly, Bastard's Death Sweep. <laughs> right, if we're having a Bastard's Death Sweep, which one of us is going to blow the brains out first? Right, me, 101, me. <laughs> I finished the show. Everyone's a runner, aren't they? Yeah. Chris could really fuck me up because I've just laughed. And I'm saying, oh, yeah, Chris is going to blow his brains out and laugh after the show. Well, and I'm going to do it now does. to make you look like a cunt. <laughs> just, just for that reason. What an arsehole. He Bang. laughed at someone's fucking in, in, in mental anguish and he laughed. What a <laughs> wow. You see, that, that, that's why I didn't laugh because I thought Chris is enough of a cunt to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If, I could, if you lend me some money for the bullet, I'll do it. Any other contenders? Yes, all of us. <laughs> what do listeners think? Get back to us on the Bastards Death Suite. Who's going first yeah. out of all of us? <laughs> Offer your opinions. Good bants, that. Who's go fund go fund me the cost of a bullet and I'll do it live. How about that? <laughs> You'd get those listeners go through the roof for that, wouldn't they? <laughs> Blowing your brains out live on air. They've, yeah, that's a new extreme, isn't it? To do something to get more listeners. Yeah, yeah. The, I'd love that because it'd get like seventy million hits on yeah. YouTube, wouldn't it? Fucking Hang on, brilliant. this bloke's blown his brains out yeah. live on air. <laughs> no, no, my fucking luck. It wouldn't kill me, and I'd be like paralysed for the rest of my lockdown syndrome. 
fucking... You do it wrong, play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we never win. We never go down the internet go fund me page, though, wouldn't we? With 700 <laughs> yeah. million views. Yes. We get, get you page. one of them wheelchairs, you work with a straw. Well, yeah, that, would, that, would pay, that would pay for my long-term care, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go fund me for Chris's family, and then, like, John will just keep most of it and just oh, send God. it right on. Yeah, yeah. Send you know. ten a week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give me <isn't> it. <laughs> We've been disgraceful again today, as always, and we know you like it like that. We're all disgraceful, but not totally shit. Remember that. Never totally shit. That's all from me, John and Chris. We're back on Friday. Bye for now.